Nick Phoebes through hearing his work on censorship, which has a lot of resonance here. And uh, my own interests are in uh, what I think is the, the, the follow-on to, to uh, censorship is more, uh, it's not that we, we are denied information, it's that the information we get is uh, biased, manipulated, sometimes wrong, sometimes uh, subtly coercive. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, this is early phase research I'm reporting on. We are uh, just starting really research on information manipulation. We've been formulating it and really doing brainstorming on it for the last six months quite heavily. It's based on research in other fields in persuasion research, which you may or may not be familiar with, coming out of psychology and communication studies. So what I'm going to talk about today is a conceptual framework for research. It's going to be pretty high level stuff, not so much reporting on what, what our findings are as reporting on how we're thinking about this problem of information manipulation and persuasion. Uh, our uh, focus here is on understanding manipulation so that we can recognize it when we see it, on anticipating it so that we can form uh, hypotheses where we expect to find information manipulation and go search for it, and uh, one of the byproducts of research like this is how to do it. Uh, that is the byproduct of all this. The more you study censorship, you become an expert on how to do censorship. The more you study information manipulation, you learn how to actually do it. Too. So let me talk to start off here with censorship uh, and persuasion, located in that psychology and communications literature, and uh, and located as well in the context of this uh, of what we're doing here, where we're concerned. Most of the people have been talking about censorship as a focal area. The basis there is we value free speech, the right to communicate human autonomy, an open society in which people can speak freely, and communicate ideas and opinions. Uh, censorship is a problem within that contradicts that value when we find speech blocked, when there's external control of the individual and their speech acts. Uh, we find in authoritarian regimes, we've heard of a few here, countries that crack down on people's uh, right and ability to, to speak freely. It's a kind of coercive opposition to free speech. Emphasis on, on, on coercion. It's kind of a, it's the, the heavy-handed approach to, uh, the heavy-handed threat to a free and open society. Uh, it's been around a long time. Censorship has been around a long time, but when, with the advent of the internet, we find it here as well. And the, the internet has a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it can be empowerment. It can empower us against censorship. It empowers free speech gives us a low cost of publishing, global reach of our communications, anonymity when we communicate. But the internet is a two-edged sword. It can also be a tool for censorship that threatens free speech. It allows a high degree of surveillance control uh, and so on. And obviously, that's what we've been talking about the most of today. So these are long-standing dynamics on censorship. And it's playing out now on the internet, just as earlier it played out in printed media, in broadcast media, in radio, in associations, and so on. Censorship. Now, there's another and subtly different threat to speech that we should keep our eyes on is persuasion. So here, instead of censoring speech, rather it, speech is influenced, it's manipulated, it's controlled in various ways. And we're familiar with this, uh, it, it appears in various terms and concepts. Rhetoric, use of language to persuade and influence others. Propaganda, which is always the most colorful, that's why I used it in the Type of my talk. Uh, government controls to influence our thinking. Information manipulation, the more technical term that I'll use here. It is characteristic of authoritarian societies. When we think of propaganda and so on, we often think of Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. But it's also very important for liberal democratic societies. In fact, early studies of propaganda or persuasion go back to Aristotle. Uh, he's in the context of Greek democracy. How do you influence people in an open society, in a democratic society? And if you can look at the roots of modern day propaganda, believe it or not people, the countries that were leading were the United States and England. In World War I, very significant uh, development in, in the sciences and understanding of propaganda. Edward Bernays is sort of the landmark people there. And uh, so we find persuasion replacing coercion, propaganda replacing censorship. I think there's a lot more persuasion going on in our information environment, but some of it's a little bit, probably more than we're aware of, uh, more so than this heavy hand of, of censorship that we find. It's a more insidious uh, form. 
Just like with the, with the censorship, persuasion of the internet is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, the internet can be a defense against persuasion and, and information manipulation. It allows for more unmediated expression. It allows to get information from blogs, from self-publishers, and so on. It allows for grassroots communications independent of the control of centralized publishers or government agencies and so on. On the other hand, the internet can be, of course, a tool for persuasion as well in order to achieve better and more effective persuasion, better and more effective manipulation. Um, so when it does happen, the question is how do we detect it? How do we defend against it? How to recognize persuasion in the environment around us? When you get that information on the screen, is it objective? Is it bogus? Is it biased? How do you even decide, how do you even assess it, and then how do you detect it? And once it is detected, how, what do you do about it? So if it's happening, is there, are there any mitigation procedures? I'll touch on these, but this is more uh, the other side off. I'm right now doing the big conceptual stuff, and we're getting to launch more on practical techniques for detection and mitigation. Although many of the talks here have, kind of touched, have touched on this. So let's talk about uh, the psychology of persuasion. How do you influence people's thinking? So once you understand how people think, how they're persuaded, then you can go on the internet and think about how the internet is a tool for achieving those kinds of effects. Basic model I'm going to look at, um, our focus is on the persuader. There's an agent who's trying to persuade someone else. The problem for the persuader is how to persuade people. Um, and there's sort of three parts to this. One is information inputs, what I'll call persuasion inputs that come to someone, to an individual, to their mind. The second part is the cognitive processing that goes on in someone's mind. And the third part is the actual change in mental states that occurs in a person that constitutes persuasion. So you have to, I want to define what persuasion is, those changes in mental states. The cognitive models, the way we think, are very simplified, as I'll put it here. And kind of inputs, persuasion inputs that can interact with cognitive models to influence how people actually the attitudes they adopt. What is persuasion? A change of mental states, what the research Communication scholarship calls communication effects, the effects, the outcomes of causal variables. What kind of mental states get changed? Opinion, you can have a positive or negative judgment about a person, about a proposal, about a product. Uh, perceptions can be changed, whether or not we perceive something, whether it even, even registers in our mind. Affect can be influenced, our emotional associations with a product or a person or a thing, we like and we dislike them. Or actually, you know, an action or a decision, a decision to act, would be one of the, our mental states. These are the things that are the target of attempts at persuasion. Influence someone's opinion, change their perceptions of a situation, influence their affective uh, relationship to a person, place, or thing, and ultimately uh, affect their decision. So they do one thing, do another. They vote a certain way. They uh, buy a certain. Examples of being persuaded, it's in our everyday language, we might judge a proposed law favorably. That judgment is the object of persuasion. We might perceive that a product is available for sale, others we don't even see them, some we perceive them. That perception can be the object of manipulation and persuasion. We might like or dislike a candidate or a foreign leader. Uh, we might decide to buy a new car, whatever it is. And we're looking at the persuader wants to achieve persuasion, i.e. wants to change the user's mental state. How do you persuade? How do you go about trying to achieve those changed states? There's inputs. I'm sort of looking at the, the human brain as an intermediating variable between inputs and outputs. And persuasion inputs, and I'll talk here, and the actual changed mental states, the decisions, the, the likes and dislikes. Um, you, you communicate, the persuader communicates information to the user that is intended to change the user's mental states. Uh, these persuasion inputs can be of various kinds, and there's a big literature on this, so I'm going to give the simplified version. Content, you can just say, hey, you should really think, be aware that this, this car is better than that car, that this candidate is better than that. I'm going to give you reasons, so you can make data and logic. That's one way to persuade people. We like to think that's the primary way. Um, it isn't necessarily so. Often we don't rely so much on the content as on the communicator him or herself. We look at the properties of the communicators. The person telling me this, trying to persuade me, are they a boss? Is it my boss? Is it a teacher? Is it someone I mistrust? Is it someone I think is neutral on the area? Or they clearly have an agenda when they try to persuade me. 
what are their intentions? Are they trying to sell me or so on? So sometimes the attributes of the person speaking are as important as what the person is saying. We use those uh, when I am the object of a persuasion attempt. That's some of the data, that some of the information that's coming to me that'll influence whether or not I am persuaded, whether I change my opinions or judgments. And I also look at the uh, the social structure of communication. The way that information arise, comes to a person may affect whether or not they're, they are <coughs> persuaded. Uh, an opinion from one person is different than an opinion, general public opinion. So if a lot of people think, or I perceive a consensus out there, I may be more subject to go with the herd, so to speak. So that's another aspect or dimension of communication not that effective. So examples of persuasion inputs, uh, I can be told this product offers the best value, kind of a rational analysis. I can be told from somebody, well, I'm an expert, and I say the following, oh, uh, well, I assess them on the basis of the expertise, that kind of meta data is attached to the uh, communication. Someone tells me they're neutral in a debate, well, that affects how I assess what they're telling me. Or I may be told most people have found such and such. And again, that most people, uh, well, that influences me. Whatever it is they find, the fact that most people find it, that meta attribute can influence my, my uh, ultimate decision. Now, between the inputs and the outputs are various ways that I process information to gather information and make a decision. Cognitive processing, cognitive processing occurs on the persuasion inputs that I just mentioned, whether it's the data, the status of the communicator, the social structure of I take those kinds of inputs and uh, take those to produce persuasion or not. So if I was a little bit better at PowerPoint, I'd have inputs, cognition, decision outputs. Uh, I'm going to talk about three, yes, my skills in PowerPoint are very limited. Uh, three cognitive models here, and there's a, a, a lot of them. Uh, one's rational choices, the way we decide things. We're probably familiar with that in economics. One is heuristics. Uh, which is shorthand ways of making decisions. Another one is uh, social proof, looking for uh, a large number of people holding the same opinion as an indicator. So these are different ways that, that people process information, three out of many. Uh, the term heuristic is much more broad than it comes in, <clears throat> and it can almost be used to apply to all the different ways we think about and process data. Uh, in computer science, it's you know, just short of an algorithm, I suppose. Uh, so one way of taking inputs and making decisions is rational choice. It's optimizing for a given choice set. We choose the one that yields the highest value. So when it comes to persuasion, uh, this can be, I can be persuaded when I'm given a choice set that the person who's trying to persuade me has manipulated the choice set so that the persuader's choice ranks highest. Uh, you know, you can, actually the classic example I always think of this was when Dick Cheney was helping George Bush select a vice president. And Dick Cheney presented one candidate, and another candidate, and another candidate. And no matter which candidate Dick Cheney produced, George Bush couldn't help but conclude that Dick Cheney was the best guy out there. Uh, some people argued that Dick Cheney skewed the choice set in such a way that he appeared, you know, any rational person would have chosen him as, as the choice set. Uh, the same thing occurred if any of you watch House of Cards on TV, there was a scene that exactly did that, right? Um, so that's one way, so you know, if you, even when someone's making rational choosing, you can influence them and persuade them by influencing the choice that, that's, that's presented to them. It happens a lot in supermarkets uh, as well. The stuff, we all choose, many of us choose rationally in the supermarket, but we choose from among what's on the shelf, things we don't even see, it's not presented to us, it's left out of the choice set. That's one way that, in, that persuasion input the choice set can be manipulated in such a way that if we're thinking according to this kind of rational chooser algorithm, it's predictable what our output is. Second way, second mode of cognition, class of cognition of these heuristics, more shortcuts for choice, rules of thumb that give us good enough, satisficing, things like that. There's lots and lots of heuristics out there. It's an interesting to study how actually people make decisions. Um, and again, you know, one class that I've that sort of mentioned before is instead of evaluating the data, it can be hard to know whether something's best or worse, the quality's good or bad. So instead, you look at the person who's, who's delivering the information, and well, if they're an expert, uh, if they're neutral, if they're a friend of mine, then okay, that's, then I'll assume that their status, the status of the communicator, stands in for an actual evaluation of the, of the data itself. So here, the persuasion input to someone, to someone who's thinking, according to this kind of heuristic would be information about the 
communicate. If you're a persuader, trying to influence someone, you can, you can influence that, that metadata, you can manipulate the metadata that tells somebody, hey, I'm trying to persuade you of this, but it's coming from a friend. The information is coming to you from a friend, which might significantly increase the chance that, that the actual um, data being presented will be adopted and influence uh, the user. So users adopt friends' opinions more than others. A uh, classic example of that, Tupperware products. Massively successful industry where products are sold through friends' networks. And the attribute of friendship <clears throat> often leads to people buying a lot of junk that they don't really need. But the fact that it's moving, it's, it's junk that's being pushed by friends very significantly affects uh, the target's uh, decision whether or not to buy. And of course, friending is very big on the internet. So you can see where some of this is leading. Um, this gets us in, in, in heuristics. There's also heuristics that aren't common to large classes of people, or that could be a little bit personal. So we've, we've heard about personalization. We've heard an interesting talk about personalization earlier. And different people sometimes think in unique ways. They can be the unique or quasi-unique characteristics of a user that makes them respond in a particular way to particular inputs. If you can profile the user, 